Okay, so uh, most folks here were in the most recent intro reversing, so the prerequisites should go pretty quick. Um, so, some architecture stuff. Um, somebody want to tell me the difference between little Indian, big Indian in terms of byte order? Little Indian is wrong. <laughs> Something other than a, a philosophical debate. The least significant bite is first. The least significant bite is first. When you say first, reading into which direction? Address. As the lower address. Okay. Yes. That was a little onion. And big onion is the opposite. Um, stack. No, we covered most of that. Programming. Yay. Let's see. Structures, classes, control flow. Um, I mean, we, can, we can skip most of this unless anybody has questions they want me to, to cover since we just did this two weeks ago. Um, I mean, we talked about loops. Well, here, here's one thing. How do we deal with loops in, in IDA? If we have, if we, well, first, how do we identify that there's a loop? How does IDA help us out with that? Bolded lines. What was that? The bolded lines. Yep, bold, bold lines with the lines between the um, blocks of code. If one of them is bold, that means IDA um, believes it is uh, looping back. Um, and how do we deal with uh, nested loops when we have one loop inside of another one? Anybody remember that one? Anybody, anybody online? Remember that one? How do we deal with nested loops? I don't. <laughs> uh, Corey says node grouping. Yeah. Um, and and we also hear uh, that we we hide them. Yes. Um, you start with the innermost loop, identify that one, um, group those nodes together, and then group the outer loop. You can group all of the loops in a in a large, complicated function, and that'll make going through a little uh, easier visually um, when you expand one of the loops, figure what that does, and then collapse it, and then you don't have all those nodes and lines getting in the way of trying to figure out what the next grouping is doing. If I may, um, one of the things that threw me off, one of the ways you're not supposed to group or figure out what loops are is look at the increment variable because they'll, they can be reused if you have multiple yes. uh, sequential loops in a program. Yes, yes, that's, that's a good good one there, Carson. Um, don't just look at the um, the increment variable, the variable that's um, being used for, for a regular looping where you start out with the initializing it. And then you uh, do the you know I plus um, plus at the end. Uh, don't just look at that because those can be reused between loops. Let's see. Talk about PD files. Um, sections. Do section names mean anything? This is an important one for malware. Do section names mean anything? They mean something by convention, but they don't have to be used per convention. So, so Zeno has just said they mean something by convention, but they don't have to be used. Um, that's that's basically right. The section names are put in there by the compiler as a, a way of saying, oh, he, here's your, your code section, and here's your, your data, and here's the read-only data as a way of, of helping, um, basically helping somebody who's taking a look at that binary, reversing it, uh, analyzing it. But in terms of actual execution of the binary, those names mean nothing. It can be section one, section two, section three. Yay. The the 
the loader doesn't actually pay tenders to those at all. So right. Um, each section will have um, a particular um, um, attributes to it. Like this is this section is um, contains executable um, bytes. This section you know can be written to, or this section can only be read from. It can't be written to, um, and that is what the loader uses to load in memory and mark those particular pages. I want to say. Um, and from that, um, then the loader takes a look at the, this is very, um, very kind of loosely what happens, but, but basically it, it takes a look at what the uh, entry point um, that's specified in the PE header goes to that and starts executing there. There's some other things that about like loading um, uh, libraries into memory as well. On setting up the uh, the import table, take life of binaries. That's great, class. <laughs> okay, well that's that's going to be important to remember about the section names. Um, what what does IAT mean? What does IAT stand for? Anybody remember that? Folks online, let me get somebody on there. <laughs> Yeah, import address table. That's right, Matt. IT stands for import address table. That's where the imports are in memory, the, the actual addresses. And uh, IDA is um, nice enough when you uh, uh, load a binary up and it actually it says, you know, instead of call an address, you know, a, a four byte address, it, it actually says, oh no, that is. You know, write to file, or you know that is connect, and it actually puts it in there. So that's nice of, of Ida for us. Uh, some some Ida quick review, and for those folks who are here in McLean, since you don't have internet access, I got a uh, cheat sheet for um, actually, actually reverse engineering a malware cheat sheet. For those online, if you're not aware, um, Lenny's also put together a a nice set of cheat sheets, and I just printed off the reverse engineering of malware one um, for the uh, folks here in the claim. Um, and that has some, some very basic um, IDA uh, key, uh, shortcuts as well as Ollie debug, which we'll be getting into later in the course, and those will be good references for you. Um, big thing to remember, G, or go to a specific address or uh, function, uh, escape to go backwards, and control enter to go forwards. So to go, when I say backwards, go to like the previous function you were in, um, or go to the function that you just escaped out of for the uh, control enter. Any questions on, on moving around in IDA? Um, any anything? Oh. Yeah, Lenny Zelster teaches the SAN 610 course, um, or was the, the original teacher of it. They got a couple other people teaching now as well. Let me type that in here. All right. If you have any questions about moving around in IDA, feel free to you know, speak up. This isn't a, a how to use IDA course, but it's our main analysis tool, so it's definitely important to know how to use. Um, debugging. Step into versus step over. What, is, what do those mean? Somebody here in McLean. I want to differentiate that. Drew? Step into will go into the function. Step over will have over function to return. Yep. Step into will will go into if your breakpoint um, or if your your EIP is currently 
uh, sitting at a call. If you step into, it will actually go into that function and bring you to the first instruction in that function. If you step over, it will execute everything in that um, function and everything that it calls and bring you to the um, and break on the next instruction after the call. Uh, that is good to know. Uh, Breakpoint software versus hardware. When when would you want to use software? When would you want to use hardware? What are the pros and cons? Sean? I uh, don't know. <laughs> Blake? Alex? I'm trying to remember what a hardware breakpoint is. Is it when a, a memory location is accessed? The, the okay. So software breakpoint is when you substitute a CC by an entry for a particular instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, but then a hardware breakpoint, that, that's when um, What the processor offers some sort of ability to, to halt when when a memory location is accessed, but it's not exact. Is that, is that about right? Um, almost. Yeah, Corey's saying hardware is better, but has limited number you can set. Use the DR registers. Yep. So there are registers on the CPU for the hardware breakpoints that you can use for um, break on execute uh, on on memory access on on memory being specifically written to. But you only have since it's in the hardware um, on the CPU. There's only a limited number. For uh, what we're going to be working with, there's uh, four, I believe. So they're good when you're dealing with malware, particularly, uh, and we'll get into this more, but they're good when you're dealing with malware, particularly uh, in case there's some kind of um, unpacking going on that actually validates what the code is in memory or um, overwrites the code. Um, in memory in order to um, to do something that the analyst wasn't expecting. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely run into that. But at the same time, um, the, the uh, software breakpoints, you can have as many as you want in there because it is just simply replacing the instruction um, with the CC. And then when it breaks, the debugger will um, replace it back with the original instruction. So I had a, um, a more general question. When you're executing or when you're debugging a program in IDA, is it, when you're looking at like the registers, the memory space or whatever, is that like actually what's going on or is it emulating all that and then add, and putting another layer of abstraction in? That is actually what is going on. Okay. It's not doing. Yeah, it's not. It's not doing any kind of emulation. Let me let me back that up a little bit. Unless you're using an emulator in combination, um, okay. Ida has a a um, box emulator that you can use. Uh, if you specifically use that, then there's that okay. emulation um, piece in between. And it, you can do that uh, because it then has more control over it. Whereas if you're doing it right on your system, it's just it's showing you what is actually happening on your system. Okay. Are, are hardware breakpoints precise in, in that do they break on exactly the instruction that, um, that accesses. That accesses. Mm -hmm. 
It's like a data read or write. It's actually breaking after the read or write has taken place on the next instruction after it. If it's an execute, then it breaks on the execute instruction. So. Yep, thank you, Zeno. Okay. So Zeno, for those online, if you didn't hear, Zeno mentioned that the when it's the for the hardware breakpoint when it's on um, execute, it will actually break before the execution. But if it's on um, like memory access, uh, a read or a write, um, the the read or the write occurs first, and then it breaks. Okay. Talk about that. 